So these last number of months, we've been looking and going through the, the book of Galatians and highlighting the fact that the gospel does not need any updates. That it is the power of God unto salvation. And this afternoon, or this morning, we're still there, we join together to walk with some of our brothers, uh, brothers and sisters as they, they go through the waters of baptism. A public declaration of an inward reality. The Apostle Paul gives us a good picture of what baptism is in Romans chapter 6. He writes in verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin live in it any longer? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with Jesus by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Just in this short passage of scripture, Paul paints a picture in our head of what is going on in baptism. And baptism, like communion, it communicates the gospel. That in the waters of baptism, there we are, we lie dead in our sins, and in Christ we die in Christ, and we are raised together in newness of life. We've been going through the book of Galatians these past few months, and we've been seeing how Christ took upon himself the penalty for our sins. And that penalty was death. The scripture says that the wages of sin is death. Every man, every woman born of Adam and Eve are born with sin. Sin that separates us from God and are destined to eternity lost. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's the good news of the gospel. That God stepped into our worst situation and became the solution for our sins. We've been hammering the point that there's, there's nothing we can do to pay for our own sins. There's no work of righteousness that we can produce in and of ourselves that would bring us from death into favor with God. Christ dying for us on the cross is our only means so that we might be forgiven, that we might be born again. That is the message of Galatians that we have been celebrating and recognizing that that message does not need to be updated. It doesn't need to be tweaked. It doesn't need to be made more palatable. It just needs to be received by faith. That's what Paul is saying in verse three and four, where he says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. That symbolized in when we're brought down under the waters of baptism. Baptism is a picture of that spiritual reality that we are dying to self, we are dying in Christ, in fact, with Christ, but you see, you don't stay there. Isn't that good news? We don't stay dead. You were never, in fact, you were never intended to stay there. You were brought under the waters of baptism solely for the purpose of being raised to newness of life. That's what Christ did for us. Christ provided a way for we who were dead in our trespasses and sins to be raised together in newness of life. Look at verse four. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
That's the gospel. That we exchange our life for his. This morning, I want to focus a few moments. I'm not going to be long, but I want to focus on what does it look like for the Christian to walk in newness of life? How does that play out? What does that, what does that look like? We've already recognized and are thankful for the fact that there's nothing we can do to find favor with God in and of ourselves. It is solely upon what Christ has done for us. We died with him and we are raised to newness of life. But what does that look like? How does that get carried out? in our day to day. As Christians, we love and we experience the joys of being forgiven, of being in right standing before God. There's no greater joy of knowing that if my heart were to stop beating right now, I'd be in the presence of Jesus. I'll tell you what, there is no greater peace than that. And it's solely on the merits of Christ. This morning, I want us to focus though on what does it look like to walk in newness of life? This is important for us to understand because we've been spending so much time on the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and the love of God, which is wonderful. We need to ensure that our lives present a proper response to that grace that has been so freely given. Again, not to be saved, but because we have been saved. You see, when we solely embrace just the grace of God and it doesn't change us, it doesn't impact the newness of life, it doesn't change the way we live our lives, I question whether we have truly embraced the grace of God. That's the point that Paul is making in the opening of this letter. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, certainly not. I love what the New King James says. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. Christ bore our punishment, not so we can keep on sinning, but so that we can walk according to the way God designed for us to be walking. And when we're walking in the way that God designed us to be walking, we experience the joy and purpose and peace that God provides for us in Christ. Christ bore our punishment, not so we can keep on sinning, but so that we can walk according to the way God designed for us to walk, to live in such a way that our life is a reflection of the life of Christ in the world today. Sometimes these simple truths of Christianity get lost in all the chatter. We who have embraced Christ, we who have exchanged our sinful nature for the righteousness of Christ, now move out in newness of life in such a way that our life looks like the life of Christ in the world today. I want to break this down into the simplest of terms so that, our, so that from our youngest to our eldest today that we might understand this. Paul says it so clearly in verse 19 of chapter 2 of Galatians. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's an exchange that has taken place. My life for his. My punishment for reconciliation. And my response to what Christ has done for me ought to be seen in the way in which my life reflects 
reflects the Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. This morning, I wanted to use an acronym gospel just to make it easy to remember. I just want to look at six characteristics of what walking in newness of life looks like. What are six characteristics, right? So our, 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 our brethren are gonna go through the waters of baptism. They're going to be raised to newness of life. And I wanna to promote, to, to promote to you six characteristics of what that newness of life ought to look like. Hey, not just for them, but for every one of us who have embraced Christ as our savior. In fact, each of these characteristics can be seen in the life of Christ himself. And we who are Christians, we who have embraced Christ, ought to seek to reflect these characteristics in every one of our days. We're gonna go through them very quickly. Number one, using the acronym of gospel, the first thing that ought to be a characteristic of the newness of life is a genuine love for God. A genuine love for God. Listen, your genuine love of God has nothing to do with how much Bible you have memorized, how often you go to church, or what religious activity you engage in. Religion will never satisfy. And we can do all the right things, but if we do it for the wrong reason, if we do it for anything other than the love for God, genuine love of God, it's not going to satisfy. Jesus gives us the new commandment. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And I want to set you free this morning from this feeling like you have all these do's and don'ts as a Christian. My challenge to you would be this, just passionately follow Jesus, passionately love after him. And here's what happens. When you love Jesus with all of your heart, you'll love what he loves. You'll despise what he despises. But everything you do will flow out of a heart of love and not ritual and rules and regulations that bind us up. What motivated this whole work of redemption was the fact that God so loved the world. And our response should be nothing more and nothing less than love, genuine love for God. Genuine love for God. Secondly, one of the characteristics of walking in newness of life is in obedience to God's word. In obedience to God's word, not just the parts we like, right? Obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. First John chapter one, verse six, John writes, he says, if we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all of our sin. You see, I heard people say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm just not one of those, you know, I'm not, I'm not a good one. I don't know what that means. Either a Christian responds to the word of God with obedience out of love for Jesus. Can I just tell you, every no in the scripture that God puts out there for you and I is to protect us and to keep us from being robbed of the good blessings that God wants us to have. It's the enemy that wants us to think that God's keeping things from us. Obedience to God in his word ought to be the characteristic of a child of God. We don't negotiate God's word. We don't make it palatable and say, well, you know what, this is not, this isn't, this isn't acceptable in our day today. No, God's word stands forever. It does not change or apologize or adapt to a culture or a generation or a people group. God's word stands true forever. And you see the newness of life that we are to walk out in is in obedience to God's word. Number three, one of the characteristics of newness of life is service to others. I mean, that's what Jesus did. 
The ultimate service was going to the cross for us, but all throughout his ministry on this earth, we see Jesus serving others. Peter says, as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. God has placed into the life of each and every one of us unique gifts and abilities and talents, not so that we can hoard them, but so that we can use them in service to one another. When we serve one another, we are reflecting the character of Jesus Christ in the world around us. We have to look for opportunities to serve others. It's walking in newness of life. That's what Jesus did when he walked the earth. And that's what Jesus continues to do as he walks the earth through his children. Serve one another. Number four, the characteristic of newness of life is a, a priority of the church a priority of the church. The ecclesia, that's the Greek word for church. It, it means the gathering of those summoned. I love that. The gathering of those summoned. When God calls the people to himself, we prioritize one another. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. God has created us in such a way that we are to mutually grow together, depending on one another, learning from one another, growing together, and reaching together the world for Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews reminds us, let us, not, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. As I look out and I see such a beautifully wonderful crowd, it's so nice that we're not neglecting on this day where everybody I know has plans and you're going here and going there, that you prioritized the house of God, the gathering of those summoned to bring worship and honor to Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews says, not to neglect to meet together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another all the more as the day approaches. Can I tell you the day of the Lord is approaching? All of creation screams that that day rapidly approaches. That day where Jesus is gonna call the church to himself in that glorious rapture. But until that moment, we gather, we celebrate, we worship, we love, and we go into all the world and make disciples which is our next point, the E in gospel. One of the characteristics of walking in newness of life is evangelism. Evangelism. We were bought by the blood of Christ, redeemed by him. You and I were born on purpose and for a purpose. And listen, your why in life is about reflecting Jesus to the world around us. He is our mission. And if we will utilize the, the community we live in, the place that God has us as our mission field to reflect Jesus, that's what we're called to do. Walking in newness of life means that we are Jesus in our community, Jesus in our family, Jesus on, in the workplace, Jesus everywhere we go, reflecting the love of God. And as one old soul said, using words only when necessary, let our lives communicate the good news. And then when we get that opportunity to preach the gospel to them. You've heard of the I am's of Jesus right? I am the door. I am the, I am the good shepherd. I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the life. Did you ever hear of the I am's of Paul? 
Paul had some I am's as well. We read about them in Romans chapter four, one in verse 14. He said, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I love what Paul says here in these two verses of scripture. He says three things. He says, I am a debtor, I am ready, and I am not ashamed. He said, I am a debtor. I recognize that I have freely received and I am in debt to all men, all women, to bring that free gift of God and share it with other people. He said, I am a debtor. Secondly, he said, I am ready. Listen, you don't need a Bible degree. You don't, you don't need to go through any special class to be a, a witness, to be a testimony for Jesus. If you have embraced him as the lover of your soul, you are ready to share what he has done for you. Paul said, I am a debtor. I am ready. I love that he said, with as much as is in me. In other words, I don't have it all together. I don't have everything I, need, I think I need, but what I have is enough, and therefore I am ready. I am a debtor, I am ready. And then thirdly he said, and I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. He has seen lives changed, starting with his own. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you recipients of that free gift of God? May we champion the cause of Christ and bring it to the world around us. And then lastly, the L in gospel, a characteristic of walking in the newness of life is love for one another. Love for one another. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also ought to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Listen to what Jesus said. By this, by what? By the love that we have for one another, all will, the world will know that we are Jesus' disciples because our love for one another ought to reflect the love that Jesus has for one another. Sometimes our words fall short when our actions don't back them up. The love of Christ poured out on one another is how we reflect the love of Christ to one another. These are just some of the ways in which that newness of life is played out, is lived out in our everyday. And as we come to the baptism, we're reminded of what Paul says in verse 19. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I do live now in the flesh, I, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what baptism is about. It's a public declaration of this very reality. We were at home yesterday and we watched a, a really great biography of the missionaries to Burma, Adnarm and Anna Judson. I encourage you to, to read that, but I, I learned something I didn't know about them yesterday. That just prior to going to the mission field in Burma, amongst a very volatile people, they were wed before they left. They got married. But at their marriage ceremony, they also had a funeral for them because they knew they'd never come back to America. They were saying to all of their family and their friends, we're married today and let's celebrate our death today as well because it is no longer I who live, 
but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live by faith, I live in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And they, they celebrated their funeral before they launched off into Burma, followed the call of God in their lives. That's what baptism is. Baptism is a reminder that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. For those in the early church, as well as those within the persecuted church today, baptism is a declaration of a person's willingness to die for their faith. Because sometimes that is the very cost of following Christ. Thankfully, not right now here in America. That's not our reality. And I pray it never becomes that. But that public declaration was an issue of their own death sentence. Because to be a Christian was forbidden in many of the countries of the world. But they did it willingly. Knowing that the one who awaited them came and lived and died and rose again so that we could walk in newness of life. That's the beauty of baptism. It's a symbol, a picture of the gospel. <laughs> 